All right, and with that, we're gonna get started as promised. So, road mapping the benchmarks. We wanted to explore each dimension to observe its effects on optimal memory allocation. Uh, our first thought was to create a single benchmark that spanned all five dimensions, find the centroid, uh, vary the arguments along each dimension separately, uh, uh, and have a, such a uh, one single benchmark. And creating such a thing not only wasn't easy, we couldn't figure out how to do it. So we finally settled on four separate benchmarks. Benchmark one addresses the first two dimensions. Uh, so benchmark one, considerations. Uh, we tried not to uh, assume the answers we expected. This is really important. If you know the answer, what are you doing? So we tried to explore things in a very general way, gather all the data, and see what fell out. Okay. We use successive power of twos, which is a really good thing to do. We often just show the exponent. So for example, um, we say five instead of two to the fifth. Five means 32. It's just convenient, okay? Uh, we contrast disparate results of different sizes by holding two similar parameters, like two temporal parameters or two physical parameters, the product constant which means the sum of the exponents is constant. So we trade them off. So for example, subsystem size versus number of subsystems. If I tell you that the combined size times the number of su subsystem size times the number of subsystems is 25, that means that the size of my program is two to the 25th. And then I'll vary them so that the size of my program stays the same and we see the effect of varying the system size and the number of subsystems, the subsystem size and the number of subsystems together. So which is better, to have two subsystems that are large or 32 subsystems that are smaller? Well, what's going on there? Those are the kind of questions we want to ask because it's not absolute time, it's relative times that are really important for understanding what's going on. Now, I'm just going to give you, we chose this architecture, so I'm putting it up here for reference. It's not the only one we tried. We picked this one because we can't go through all the data. Trust me. But this was representative. We didn't cherry pick it. It just is. But it's not special. It just is. Yes? Oh, we have a list. If you want to go to our GitHub, Bloomberg GitHub, uh, you can find out all the different, the question was, did you do it on, what was the name of it? Embedded. Embedded, no, not embedded. We did it on uh, GCC and Clang and, and uh, Microsoft's Windows, and you can find all that data. It exists. It's published. Okay. All right. So here's how we compiled all the programs. Uh, Except, so all experiments used only one quarter, quarter at a time except for the last one, and uh, that's for contention. So now we need to talk about uh, T.C. Malik and J.E. Malik. Some people think that these are better than what is supplied. Now, this was true at one point. Doesn't seem to be true anymore, at least for the benchmarks that we ran. It is possible that these are still better than the off-the-shelf Clang or GCC allocator. But that doesn't matter because for these benchmarks, these didn't do as well as the built-ins, okay? And particularly, these are good for multi-threaded applications and that was not what we did mostly. That was only one of our benchmarks, okay? So remember, we're gonna use the platform's global allocator we tried these, they're not as good, so we didn't worry about them, okay? Just saying, we didn't forget them. <clears throat> All right, so here are our four benchmarks, our roadmap. We're gonna look at these four things. Then we're gonna be done, then we're gonna hopefully have some time for questions, so I am gonna move along, and I have 58 minutes or something like that left. Here we go. Short running build up, use tear down. Here's my, whoa, that was quick. Go back. This is my symbol. So we're firing a missile. A few seconds, it's over. That's my, that's my icon. All right, so considerations. 
initially wanted to investigate allocation density. We focused on allocation, deallocation costs themselves. We chose a variety of common data structures in string, vector, unordered, set. Um, we didn't want to access locality uh, we, uh, to access locality to dominate the results, which means we wrote just the first byte. Remember that locality is an extremely powerful benefit of allocators, and we could lose all the individual benefits by focusing on locality. So except for the locality experiment, which is the most involved, everything else tries to minimize it. Later, we incorporated variation into the allocated memory. So we have object capacities. Uh, uh, vector uh, capacities are, are reserved up front. So a vector has only one allocation at all times, whereas strings are deliberately not one size. They range in size from 33 to 1,000 with, with, a, with a, uh, a uniform distribution. And so that's what we're seeing there. Our, we chose 33 because 32 is our short string optimization limit. Okay? If it's under, if it's 32 or under, it would be just one size. Okay. So here are some simple data structures. Vector of int, vector of string, unordered set of int, and unordered set of string. Do these seem like useful things that you might use in a program? Would we want to actually try to see what allocators do with these guys just for fun? OK. So if anybody didn't know, this is what a vector of int looks like schematically. Don't laugh. Whoops. Come on, go back. Why do you do this to me? Ah, come on. One, two. This is a vector of string because we have the string objects and then we have the allocated string. Okay. The next one is an unordered set of int. And finally, we have an unordered set of string. I remember where I was when I drew these. These are not easy to draw and have them look like a, a kindergartner didn't draw them. So just saying. All right. So the plan. For each data structure in a thoughtfully chosen set, we're going to create a data structure, access it lightly, destroy it, and repeat until the problem size n is reached. Does that make sense? We're just going to do it over and over. Build it up, use it, tear it down, see what happens. And the use is extremely light, so we're focusing on building it up and tearing it down. Otherwise, we'd be testing the access part. Does that make sense? This is where we're worried about how much it takes, how much effort it takes to allocate it, as opposed to once we've allocated it. Oh, darn it. OK. So we chose an overall problem size of n equals 2 to the 27. Um, and the size is going to, or the container size, is going to range from 2 to the 8 to 2 to the 16. OK? So the number of experiment repetitions is n over s. Is that bytes or elements? Uh, it's, that's a good question. The, the, it's, it's elements. OK. So container size, and, and, and remember, these are comparing the same data structure. So what we're trading off is the container size and experiment repetitions. So we're not comparing vector of int with vector of, of string. That's not important. What's important is vector of int with vector of int in a different ratio, in a different uh, size. We're looking at how the size of the container is affected with and without allocators, or with the different allocation strategies, if you will. So, so when I say n equals 27, I mean log of n equals 27. And these are all exponents. So each result is in absolute runtime in seconds. So here's vector of int. Now, you're probably going to say, I don't really know what all these black and white uh, uh, numbers are on here. What does that mean? We've got these 14 strategies, and we've got these different sizes. And look at all this wonderful data. This particular example is not very interesting because there's only one allocation going on, which is vector of int. So this whole slide isn't really all that interesting. But it is interesting because we need to do a little better. So let's see if we can make it a little more readable. Does that help? How about we put some guidelines in? Does anybody remember what happened when Dorothy's um, house landed in Oz? So the idea is we really would like to see some color in this, because this is a heat map. 
And now things become a little bit more readable. And if you look at the global, that's the global allocator. And then we have four different kinds of monotonic allocator. We have them with and without a virtual function interface. And then we have winking and not winking in each case. So if you just look at this, this is all 14 strategies, all color coded. And you don't have to look too hard to see that the global allocators are darker red. Red means more expensive. Green means fast. Now, this isn't that interesting a data structure, as I said, because there's only one allocation. So we can't learn too much from this. But we can learn a little more from a vector of string. And a vector of string makes things a little clearer. You notice that the global allocator is red. Again, both of them. The monotonic is looking pretty good. The multi-pool in front of the monotonic is not quite as good. And the multi-pool, it's better than the global allocator by a factor of two, but it's not as good. So just looking at this, which allocator do you think you'd use if you had a vector of strings and you wanted to build it up really quickly, use it, and get rid of it? Monotonic. It's not a hard problem. OK. Let's just keep going because here is an unordered set of int. And oh, look. Which would you use? Monotonic. OK. How about an unordered set of strings? Guesses? Well, what do you know? OK. Whoops. Lost it. Oh, do we have any questions on this? No? Yes? What do you think? Yes? Yes. The vec the wink was slower than the not winking. There's a little bit of error in the in, in what's going on, and also the wink doesn't do anything. So it's actually a it's a, a useless call. So between the two, there could be a little bit could be a little bit more expensive because the wink doesn't really wink anything. No, no, what I'm saying is it doesn't, there's nothing to be done. So you're doing something that doesn't do anything, which is more expensive than not doing it. Okay, yes. We didn't want to use ordered sets because the node based containers that are unordered, whatever, uh, get the job done as an example of a node based container. And we could have done ordered sets, which we did, and they're no different. There's no additional value. However, we're not done. So the next thing we did is we said, well, let's make it a little bit more interesting. Let's make a vector of vector of int, vector of vector of string, vector of unordered set of int, vector of unordered set of string, and unordered set of the four. So now we have some more data structures. And composite data structures, they're much larger. So we picked an intermediate size and stuck with it for pretty arbitrary reasons, right? And so this is what we did. Kept the overall size 2 to the 27th. There's an internal size of 2 to the 7th. Uh, we still varied the outer size from 2 to the 8th to the 16th, and this is the stuff. But it really doesn't matter. You know, this is, this is the, the outer container size is this. The inner one is constant, and then those vary, and the product is still 27. You get the idea, right? We just, we're varying the, 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 the outer keeping the middle one fixed, and then, yes? OK. So remember this. So here is data set 5. This is uh, vector, vector, of int. Now look at it. Which one would you use, and, and by how much? Monotonic. But do you see the difference in performance? Roughly a factor of 5. OK. So let's look at data set 6. Um, there's little variation between. Uh, hold on. There's a little bit. Go ahead. So the wink one is significantly better or almost than the other one. But otherwise, it's almost noise across the board, except for the global one. So what your point is, we shouldn't use global, but otherwise, we don't care? So, so remember, remember vector vector of int is 
not as exciting. Vector of n is unexciting. Vector of vector of n is somewhat exciting. It's like vector of string. Yeah. All right, well, let's keep looking because I think we're going to see a trend now. Notice the little virtual function overhead. Notice that we see that using the virtual function here causes some overhead, which is to be expected because while the outer part of the container can inline, the inner one can't. So what's going to happen is there is some overhead. But again, notice you start out with the other one, and then when you add in the wink, it's actually faster. The virtual one with the wink is faster than if you didn't do it at all and baked it into the type. My point is that that's all noise, but when you look at the global one, OMG, who cares? All right, seven, you see a pattern. I just want you to look. Notice there's more virtual function overhead here. Now, even with the winking with the virtual, it's actually you know, one tick slower. But compare it to the cost of the global. Who cares? This is noise. Yes? Is the global embed a vector? It's the, it's the general purpose allocator that comes with the system. So is that an emulation of what we're doing with the vector? It's part of it. It's not all of it. When you see the next experiment, you'll see that it's none of it. OK. <laughs> All right, winking matters. So I just want you to notice the left column. And we can go look at this in detail. But the point is, without question, any local allocator is better than that beast. And if you just go with the monotonic, and by the way, just to tell you, the person who actually did this experiment didn't put the monotonic on the stack, but instead put it in some corner of the system, the monotonic would actually be much faster than is shown here. Just full disclosure. This is, a, this is, this is deliberately not as good as it really would be. Not deliberately, but it, it clearly was, is no worse than this. And if it were on the stack, it would be potentially even better. All right, so observation. Global allocators are always inferior. Question, what local allocator strategy is best? And the plan is let's look again but gray out the global allocator so we can get some more texture. And I'm just going to go through this because you'll see this is not a good choice. Generally speaking, whoops, let me back up, sorry. This is D2, D3, D4. And then we'll go on to the other ones, please, G5. D6, D7, D8, D9, D10, D11, and D12. Whoops, sorry. OK, the point is, you can go back and look at it on the video. I just wanted to get it all there for people to see. But the bottom line is, use the monotonic allocator and call it a day for these kinds of things, period. All right, so we have these dimensional characterizations, and the question mark means that's what we're measuring. We're also measuring the variation. The access locality is low by design. Uh, the memory utilization is one. We build it up, we use it, we tear it down. There's no, we're using all the memory at one point. There's no contention. Takeaway messages. Global allocators are consistently inferior when dealing with systems having a short focus duration irrespective of contention. For systems having a util uh, high utilization, such as those modeled in this benchmark, a monotonic allocator is always superior, especially when applied to a stack buffer residing on the program stack, similar in effect to allocate in C. If you learn nothing else from this talk, not bad, huh? OK. Questions on this? No heckling yet. OK. This experiment is mine. I invented this one, all by my lonesome. Uh, long running time multiplex subsystems, and we're going to look at access locality. And so the considerations are uh, investigate access locality, observe the effects both physically and temporally, simulate concurrent subsystems as in time multiplex subsystems like ASIO. Um, vary both size and time slices. Uh, we want the locality to dominate the results this time. So this, the access, accessing the data should be in hours 
and the buildup and teardown should be negligible, e.g. in seconds. So we're not worried about that. We're worried only about the time to access the data. This is a completely different thing. This is not what people think about. This is the most important use of allocators that could possibly be. Okay? So we have a system as subsystems. Now, what's a subsystem? Well, we're going to call it a linked list because this is a model. We're modeling things that really happen. Um, so it looks like this. this is a ve vector of list event. And the creation plan is we're going to build up this vector uh, with, with, some, uh, with some number of, of subsystems. So we're going to build it up from scratch. Then we're going to tear it down. Uh, and the result is an initialized data structure. This is the build up and tear down thing. So what happens? Build up the system. We create the vector. And here's our memory. And then that's the vector. We just allocated the vector or whatever we're going to hold the stuff. And then we're going to ignore the cache for now. And we're going to build up the system. So here we just allocated a link. OK? And what happens in memory? Well, there's our link. And then we do another one. And then here's memory. And we do that. And then we allocate a bunch more. And then in memory, what happens? OK? And then we do one more. And you'll see a pattern. Surprise. <laughs> then we go to the next one. OK? And now what happens? OK. And now what happens? OK. So you see what's happening? Now we're going to build this whole thing up. And see how it works? See a pattern here? OK. So that's what happens. That's what's happening in memory. Now, the next thing is we're going to access, we're going to visit each subsystem in turn. For each subsystem, we're going to write to uh, each of the int values in order, which means the linked list is a linked list of int. We're going to repeat the sequence of writes for a total of i iterations. We're going to advance to the next subsystem and repeat the entire thing for a total of r repetitions. And the experiment is wall clock time. No memory is allocated or deallocated at all. Yes, sir. Louder. Okay. So, so, so okay. So can I can I suggest something? First of all, the point is, we're doing this in order. It's necessary for the experiment because in order to see how bad it is when it's out of order, we have to compare it with in order. Okay, so I'll get there. So we're gonna we're gonna write each of the int values in order. So what does that look like? So here's a subsystem, and watch. See, I'm writing it. Now we don't know how long this could go forever because it could be a very large subsystem. Very large. Okay, it's done. And then we just did one iteration. But we're going to repeat that for i iteration. So in this case, i is 2. OK, so did that just skip over my iteration? That's terrible. i is 2. Go ahead. Do What? 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 Let's see this here. i is 2. Oh, there we go. It's on autopilot. That's what's happening. So what's going to happen is this is going to do i see. So it's doing two iterations. So i is 2, so it's going to go through this twice. There we go. Now, then I'm going to go to advance to the next subsystem. I forgot. I, I kind of automated. I streamlined this so I could get a chance to get a drink. And then it goes to the next one. You see this pattern happening, right? And then. So I'm trying to speed it up in time because you guys could get very bored seeing this keep going, right? And then finally, we get to here. Now, there could be a very large number of systems. So right now, we're imagining that this is just a few links, but very many systems. And then eventually, hopefully, it finishes, and then we quickly write this guy. 
So that's what a repetition is. It's going through two times, two times, two times, two times. That's one repetition. Now we're going to repeat. So what does that mean? That means we're going to make sure that the, the iterations times the repetitions is a constant. So it's going to go through and do this. And once we do that, that's one repetition. And then we go through. Now you're probably all worried because it says two to the seventh times a large number. <laughs> Let me know when you get the idea. Maybe I can stop it before then. The point is this goes for a long time. It takes a long time to get the data because this is going to run for a very long time. But I am going to spare you because you get the idea what a long time is and we have only so much time here. And I know it's fun to watch this slide. Wall clock time. Uh, OK. So the pseudocode is, I'm going to create this vector. Here it is. And we're going to build up a list. So here it is. And then we're going to tweak the little guy. So here's the little guy that we tweak. And then we're building it up. So this is for each of those guys. So what does that mean? We're going to do it for each one in the series. And then we're going to do it this many iterations, which is two. And then we're going to repeat it k times, uh, or excuse me, of the k systems, we're going to repeat that uh, r times. There, I got that right. And so that's this. So you'll notice that the blues, the product of the blues is going to stay constant, and the product of the reds are going to stay constant. m is the memory size, and then a is the accesses. So the accesses are going to be held constant, and the memory is going to be held constant. So we have two different constants. And now we go need to look at some stuff. The total size of the problem is the product of m and a. And remember, m is the physical memory size, and a is the, the temporal aspect, which is how many uh, instructions, uh, 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 excuse me, iterations times the repetitions. In other words, the total, the total accesses. OK. So n is 45. That means 32 trillion accesses. So this does take a little time anyway. So you get the idea. We're going to look at this. And here, what does 318 mean? What does 222 mean? Well, if you come over to this system, we have a large number. Of, what, is this, what does this column mean? So it means two iterations, 128 repetitions. Anything in this column is two iterations and 128 repetitions. The one on the bottom is 2 to the 1. And the, the 7 on the top is, is 2 to the 7th. OK? If I move over, it means this. If I move over, it means this. Do you get the idea? So we have a, we have a domain that's a, that's a two-dimensional uh, two dimensional domain. Yes? The question is how big of the, the, the question is how, how does the problem size relate to the cache size? Yes. We're going to look and see how it relates to it because we don't know. All we're doing is that we're creating a huge amount of an experiment and we're going to look at the data. And then we're going to guess as to what's happening. That's what we can do. OK. M is the number of elements. The elements are integer size, but we're talking about the node of the thing. And it's a linked list node, because I'm using an STD linked list. OK. So the linked list, what is it? It's got two pointers, and it's got an int. So if this is a 8-byte architecture, it's 24 bytes. Right? OK. Now the other way we have, this is eight subsystems, each of size 256K. This one is 16 subsystems of size 128K. And this one is 32 subsystems of size 64K. So you understand what the domain is. The next thing we need to look at is, now if you take a look at that, those are times in seconds. That's how long it takes to run these things. You'll notice, by the way, that the number in the upper right corner is bigger than the number in the lower left corner. These are made up numbers, but the idea is the same. So now, we'll take a look at what this is. Here what we're doing is 
we're running this program and you'll see that what's happening as we go through with things accessed in order, we can fit several subsystems in cache before we have to flush one, right? That's good. Gotcha. Okay, so you get the idea. Well, I was able to go to a subsystem, then the next, then the next, then the next, before I had to flush one. But I was doing multiple iterations, so I got two iterations without having to go to main memory. That's great, right? Yes? In your example, you're just showing that the entire vector itself is like that. Would that actually be It might not be, but it makes a nice graphic. The question is, is the vector really <laughs> held in the cache? I decided it, it looks better if it is. Does anybody really care? No, I, it's a fair point. Because seriously, that means you're actually thinking about what's going on. So the truth is, the point is, is that the vector might not actually stay in cache because maybe some of its bits might get thrown out. But as a mental, as a cartoon, speaking of cartoons, um, <laughs> it's the right idea. What about diffusion? Now I heard fragmentation over here, which is really great. This is my straight man. I have to buy him a drink or something. But anyway, what we need to do is look at the difference between when memory comes in uh, in order, which is what you'd expect if you had a clean system and you had just a global allocator acting like a local allocator and it just gave you the memory in order. There's no problem, which is why sometimes it's hard to realize why allocators are important. So the shuffle plan is going to be to go and mix this stuff up first before we do that. So I'm just going to show you what's going to happen. We're going to pop off and then push and we're going to go through this and shuffle things until they get good and shuffled. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to start, I'm going to ignore the cache, and I'm going to pop that guy. And then I'm just going to move him up. And now I'm going to push him randomly somewhere. By the way, when I pop him, it creates a hole. That's empty. But I, I still have a guy that I need to put somewhere. I'm going to put him here because that's the random place I was chosen. And now notice the color is that blue color. And then we proceed to do this again with the blue guy. Go ahead. There we go. And now that guy has a hole. And now we're going to put this somewhere. Now we put him there because that was the random place that was selected. And the idea is we're shuffling the memory. This is what would happen if we ran the system and started doing this. And what will happen over time, because we're moving we're actually doing a move as opposed to a copy, if you can imagine that. Now, move is supposed to be fast, right? Turns out that that's fun. Moves are not fast. Moves are horribly, horribly slow when it comes to access because what you're doing is you're moving the things that used to be contiguous away from each other. And so the performance over time is going to degrade, and it's going to degrade substantially. And you're going to see just how much it degrades when I get done shuffling this thing, which is going to take at least another three minutes. <laughs> Do you understand what's happening? This is what happens in a computer when you have a global allocator and it starts messing up. It's like a clean room when it starts and then it messes up. And then the stuff that used to be nice and tidy and close together gets messed up. And when things get messed up, they get slower. And what do we call that again? What? OK, I heard fragmentation. Do you realize that it is not fragmentation? Because we don't have coalescing allocators. And fragmentation and coalescing allocators go hand in hand. What we have is diffusion. Our memory is diffusing so that we're getting a homogeneous global memory that has everybody's subsystem intermixed, like oil and vinegar. It now becomes salad dressing instead of oil and vinegar. So if you like your oil and then you like your vinegar, well, guess what? You got salad dressing. It's all clear, right? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? This is what happens when you don't have local allocators because the memory is going to get messed up. And in the end, uh, so hopefully you're, you're quickly getting the idea of what this is going to be. Because I'm almost done. All right. So what happens now, we've now shuffled once. We've gone through once. Imagine if we shuffled this for a while. 
what would happen is this would look a little bit more like, hold on, we'll get there, this. Now, it wouldn't be a pattern like this unless my random number generator were particularly bad. But even this shows the point. This isn't even showing up. The idea, by the way, this is not the greatest picture. The idea is now we have, we don't have blocks anymore. We have everything intermixed in a, in a, in a way that doesn't uh, lend itself to this. Now, this is called diffusion. This is not fragmentation, yes? I have measured it. If you go through the process that I just described once, there's enough diffusion that it's dramatic. You go through a second time, 30% more, and you pretty much saturate after that. But, that. but that doesn't matter because whatever much it needs to be. This is fragmentation, by the way, just to show you the difference. This is when your memory gets scattered all over and you want to uh, allocate a big block. You have more than enough memory to do it, but there's no place to put it. This is memory fragmentation. This is really bad memory fragmentation. But it has nothing to do with this talk at all because this doesn't happen. What really happens is diffusion in this particular case. I guess fragmentation could happen if you had a really ridiculous global allocator too. I mean, anything could happen. But that's not the point. All right. So... How do we fix this? And the way we fix this is we, what we're going to need is local allocators. So the overall plan to show you how bad this is, uh, is we're going to have after we shuffle, before we shuffle, and create and shuffle. Those are three measures. So we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to measure after we shuffle, in which case it's going to be slow before we shuffle, which is going to be fast, and just create and destroy only, which is going to give us our setup costs. So the result is going to be wall clock time, and I'm just going to put this up here. The degradation ratio due to diffusion is going to be the after time minus the setup cost divided by the before time minus the setup cost, but the setup cost is negligible, so we'll ignore it. So what I really want you to think of is Degradation is just after divided by before. And by after, I mean we create it, we shuffle it, we access it the way we discussed, or we create it, we access it, we shuffle it. We're doing the same thing, we're just measuring it in a different place. Now, does everybody understand that? If you shuffle it and then access it, it's going to be worse than if you access it and then shuffle it. Okay? How much worse? Does anybody get an idea for how much worse? We're going to go with a factor 10? Let's see. So here's, here's what happens. And if you look at the shuffling, this is to answer the question. And we're sticking with the temporal locality of 10, meaning it's going to iterate 10 times just for the purposes of this experiment. And since this is the first experiment I did, I didn't realize that binary was better than decimals, so I did it in decimals. So that's what we have here. I regret it, but anyway, if you look at this, with one shuffle, one complete shuffle, you see that if I have um, a system size of 10 to the 6, then I have 10 of them. In that case, in that particular case, just one shuffle gives me an order of 10 degradation. Okay? With two shuffles, it's 15.6, and you see it quickly saturates to around 16 high 15s. So this shuffling is really significant, right? Factor of 10, factor of 15. That's what it gets to because the longer you run the system, the more shuffled it gets. And once it's shuffled, it's like this. So anyway, I think pretty much you get the idea. Uh, so anyway, after one shuffle, after two shuffles, any questions on this? Shuffling demonstrates the degradation. How are we going to fix the problem? Well, we don't want the diffusion to occur, right? So we'll talk about how we fix that in a moment. Um, anyway, so here's our example again. This is showing you the footprint. Remember, this is the number of subsystems, okay? A lot of subsystems at the bottom, 
large systems, large subsystems at the top. You see that? So let's take a look. This is what the surface looks like, and it is also a heat map. The blue means one. The ratio is one. Before, the ratio is before, at measuring after divided by measuring before. So if there's no difference, it's blue. If there's a big difference, it's red. And what you'll notice is that there's a ridge right around uh, uh, 2 to the 18th. That's a magic number that persists. So that when you have... When you have a subsystem size around 2 to the 18th, the maximum difference occurs. Also, when the locality is at the edge, meaning I have, I'm accessing each thing just one time before I move on. That means I have low temporal locality. Whereas if I accessed it 10 times, I'd have higher temporal locality. So this way is higher temporal locality. This way is lower temporal locality. Okay, and then... The physical locality, obviously, if I have only one system, there's just one system, but if I bring it down to 10 subsystems, I have more physical locality, and if I have 100, uh, uh, or, or I should say 8, if I have 8 uh, 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 large subsystems, that's where this peak is very large, and then as I go to 16 and 32 and 64 subsystems, it tapers down. Now, it's hard to see exactly how big this is from this graph, but it does give you an idea, and there's this funny thing in the front that I am unable to explain, but it is a very um, edge case. It's, 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 a, it's really bizarre, it's in this corner. So if you ignore that one point, the idea is you get something like a ridge where when you have right around, as I said, two to the 18th, or when the, the temporal locality is really low, the difference between shuffled and non-shuffled is maximized. So now, what I'm gonna do is some magic I'm going to turn this into an Excel spreadsheet. And I do want you to keep in mind that you know this is if anybody is uh, can be hypnotized because that's what about is going to happen right now. I'm going to turn this into an Excel spreadsheet. Doesn't it look like an Excel Excel spreadsheet? I think it does. Don't you think so? Well, watch this. Come on. I know you can do it. Make it happen. There we go. All right, so this is an Excel spreadsheet kind of thing. And if you look at it, you can see the lower left quadrant where we have the high physical or high temporal locality. It's very green. And if you sort of come out, it's yellow. And then you hit that band, that red band. And of course, when it gets all the way back to the top, the ratio of shuffling and unshuffling at the very top doesn't matter because shuffling doesn't do anything. It was only one system. So when you circle it, it doesn't do anything. That's to be expected. So this is just giving you an idea of like what's going on. What's going on is when you have the option for high physical and high temporal locality, that kind of thing, uh, 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 when you don't, excuse me, when you don't, when you get into these regions, then you need to make it happen. You need to actually do something to not get that crazy... Uh, factor of, of slowdown. Now this is the crazy part that happened, and I don't know why those numbers down there happened. I really don't. If we mask them off, it doesn't make any difference here, but it will turn out to later. Now, how do we solve this problem? We solve it with local memory allocators, and the way we do that is we put them on each subsystem. Not on each thread, because this is a time multiplex system. And when we do that, Look what happens. We create walls. And now, we're going to use one of these allocation strategies. Now look what happens. Look at the ratio with allocators before and after. The shuffling, instead of being a factor of 15, is a factor of 2.5. Do you see that? The local allocators stop you from order of magnitude degradation in this system. So this is with local allocators, and you can see that they do the least good right over here. But everywhere else, right, this is with local allocators. And the thing we're going to want to look at is the improvement of without to with. That's what we're looking at right now. So this is the ratio of without allocators to with allocators. So we're seeing the benefit, if you will, Okay, and the thing to realize here is it's pretty severe. Look at the multiplier you get in performance from access 
Those are real numbers. Look at those numbers. They're serious numbers. If we ignore that thing, that's some serious stuff. Would everybody, whoops, come back, come back, go back. There we go. There we go. That's a big number. That is an order of magnitude. I picked one up there. It's not the biggest one, but it gives you an idea. So 15 minutes, I got it. So do you see what I'm saying? This is an example. Just access has nothing to do with creating it and destroying it by just keeping it local and not letting it diffuse. So instead of using splice, use copy. Then your access will be good because you keep your stuff together. Yes? OK, the question is, if my list is very long. This graph is an example. We can look at a bigger one. So let's look at a bigger one to see if we can answer that question. This is a size 25, 2 to the 25. So it's bigger. Notice the shape is the same. The point is, if you, you see, we're doing the same experiment, but with a different problem, much bigger problem. And what happens when you do the much bigger problem? It just gets a much better result. Look at the difference here, 16 times. So the bigger the problem, the better. So large systems need local allocators when there are pockets of a potential for a subsystem to be dealt with uh, over a time slice, right? If you don't do that, if you do the same system without the local allocators, the diffusion will make a slowdown of 16 happen in this system. This is a model. When you have a factor of 16, there's really not much to talk about. It's not like, well, is it really 16 or is it really 15? Come on. We've done this for every size, for every platform, for everything. This is typical. So hopefully that will, anyway. So for this one, the allocation density is nil compared to what we're doing. The chunk size, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the variation is nil. Uh, the, the access locality, uh, that's what we're measuring. The memory utilization is one because we build it up, use it and tear it down, and there's no contention. And so the takeaway tips for this, for long running systems, the speed of allocation, deallocation operations themselves may be entirely irrelevant to overall runtime performance. Partitioning memory corresponding to subsystems having physical and temporal locality can nonetheless make an enormous difference in overall runtime performance. Basically everything you need to know about this talk is done now. But we're going to look at two more benchmarks much quicker, and then we'll be done. I just want to point out those two alone, that's build it up, use it, tear it down, and long-running systems is almost everything that we do. Questions? Yes? Does that mean that we should never use the global allocator? OK, the question is, should we never use the global allocator? I didn't say that. You have to decide, does performance matter? If it doesn't, use the global allocator. If it does, go to the flow chart and figure out whether there's an opportunity to take advantage of allocators. For large systems, inevitably, there will be. And if you design the large systems with allocators in mind, 100% there will be. So retrofitting, you know, who knows what you've got. But if you're designing a system with allocators in mind, absolute, emphatically 100%. And even retrofitting, we know because we've retrofitted a lot of what we've done with these allocators. And if you took them out right now, our customers would complain bitterly. So we know anecdotally they're necessary. Yes? So the consensus is you don't update to make each of those local pools. No, not, not exactly, not exactly. The premise, is, the premise is they are already a certain size. I have a subsystem, and it's this big. If it turns out it gets bigger, then I will allocate more memory from the global pool. But it will stay there in perpetuity, and that's good until that subsystem goes away. Good. So just to repeat, what he's saying is how do you know how to size it? You don't have to size it, it'll size itself. But the point is once it sizes itself, all of the memory stays there and so you are not moving a link, you're copying a value. And that's critically important. Okay. 
So let me move on. The third one is just basically, what if we have a pump? And this is going back to utilization. And we're just getting something, putting it back, getting something, putting it back. And I'm going to run through it quickly because I want to have time for people to heckle me and I'm getting a little close. So utilization, uh, it's just another example. It's not really as exciting. Uh, there's a certain amount of memory that's allocated. There's a memory size. We're going to get chunk, chunk, chunk until we hit some size. And then once we get that size, we're going to just delete, allocate, delete, allocate. And once we're done with that, we're going to delete. Now, I'll just show it right now as an animation because it's very easy. So here we just filled up. And then we're going to go through the process of, of doing this until we use up our total amount of allocations. I think it's just easier to see it this way. Uh, and then eventually we're done. And then finally, we'll just get rid of them. And that's it. So that's, all, that's our experiment. And the result is in absolute run times. And uh, the entries in each row are, uh, uh, are, are, are relative, uh, the, in each column are relative to the first one. So let's, we're not going to do any winking out because there's no advantage to winking out. And uh, remember that this is our, uh, this is our buffered sequential allocator. And this is our multi-pool allocator. Remember this guy. And anything that's oversized is going to go straight through. OK, and then uh, these are all powers of 2. So we have something. The total allocated memory is 2 to the 30 bytes. And we have varied uh, the, the memory size and the size sort of the way I've shown you here. Uh, and what else we got? These are absolute times. These are relative percentages of the absolute times. And what we're going to look at is the last three rows because What's important about those is they are larger than 2048, so they're going to overflow the multipool. And the other one to notice is that there, there are bad choices to be made here. So let's look at those things that could overflow. And, and of course, the, um, the, the, if, 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 if I'm doing something that allocates too much memory and I exhaust all of my available memory because I just build a, a buffered sequential allocator that's just too big, my stuff will fail, but the multi-pool also will become very slow because it's acting as a no-op in front of the actual allocator. So you'll see that for, for sizes above uh, the threshold of 248, the multi-pool does worse than the global. So that's what I want you to see here. And it's consistent and it's not really surprising. And the point is you have to get stuff right. And if you don't get it right, it won't be faster. So the purpose of this is, yes, allocation density is high, access locality is low, variation is zero. Memory utilization is a question mark. We're measuring it, sort of, but it's really pretty low because we don't have a lot of the memory in, in, in at any given time. And the, uh, the, 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 the contention is zero. And so the takeaway tips here are never use monotonic allocator by itself when the utilization is low and the number of bytes allocated is large, e.g. in a loop. Beware that multipool allocator passes its request to the backing allocator when the chunk size of memory being allocated exceeds the maximum pool size, e.g. 2048, which is an implementation detail, but you should know it if you're trying to optimize for performance. And that's adjustable. I'm just going to go, if, th there's nothing really special about this. We can talk about it afterwards unless somebody has a burning question. OK, let's just do the last one. And contention. The bottom line about contention, and I'm just going to talk about it as I put this up so people can read this at their convenience, but the idea is, is that contention is something that global allocators really try to work hard to do, and they, they put in all this effort, and if they're really good, they can approximate it, but they can't come close to having un-sequenced un, uh, memory access. So if you're able to, to arrange your allocations in such a way that, that you don't have to worry about contention, there is no way that a global allocator can compete with that. And so I'm just going to show you again, uh, if you look at this, and it really doesn't matter what the details are so much. You can go back and look at it in, in GitHub. But the idea is that any of these other guys uh, are, are under 100%. So you see the global allocator, that's the absolute time. That's the relative time with the virtual thing. And all of these guys are a factor of uh, three, four, better, just a constant factor but a factor better. Now, the only way that, that uh, a global allocator can do anything is try to base its decisions on uh, one thread per 
um, uh, subsystem. If that's not how your world is arranged, let's say you're using ASIO, or let's say you're using thread pools or whatever, it's not going to work. Got it. So you're going to have to do something different. And I'm going to run through this, but the idea is nothing much changes. This is a bad choice, the monotonic one here again, because um, this thing is growing. Uh, and so the, the one you would probably want to use here is either the multi-pool or the multi-pool backed by the monotonic. Notice how that one has some advantages at some points. So anyway, that's the single thread, and this is the, multi, the multiple threads working together. And I'm just going to run through this quickly. Ah, and you can get an idea. But the main point is, choose the right allocator for the situation. And allocation density is high, chunk size variation, zero. Access locality, low. Memory utilization, nil. And contention, uh, zero or high is really all there was. This didn't quite follow the same thing. The takeaway tips are, make subsystems memory explicit using local allocators to obviate infinity in thread pools, as well as thread aware global memory allocators. Uh, Second one is use a composite multi-pool mono allocation strategy, that's AS11 to 14, when utilization is low, especially when variation V is high, so long as the size of the individual chunks are smaller than the pooling threshold, e.g. 2K bytes. Simple, right? Anyway, you got exposed to it. You see about what's going on. And I do want to mention just briefly that fault sharing is something that can be a problem. If you don't know what it is, I won't explain it now, but I will tell you that fault sharing uh, can cause problems and diffusion uh, can cause fault sharing. And memory allocators can make it possible that no fault sharing occurs because all of the stuff in each subsystem that's being worked on by a different thread is independent, has independent cache lines. So if you know what I just said, then you know what I just said. And if you don't know what I just said, no worries. Um, <laughs> so we had a problem. Uh, we got all the right data, but we, we actually screwed up. And we got the columns wrong. We didn't know how to explain it. And then there's this fellow, Graham Blaney, who was uh, working uh, at, our, at our company uh, uh, as an intern. And I asked him, because he's really good, to go and redo the experiments and figure out what we did wrong. And he came up with something called fragmentability while he was doing everything that we said uh, he should do. And the concept of fragmentability is simply, if you have a data structure that is only one piece, its fragmentability is zero. That's like a vector of int. And if you have a data structure that's got lots of moving parts, like a unordered uh, uh, map of unordered map of, of string, then its fragmentability is huge. And those are the kinds of things that really beg to have an allocator so that they don't fly apart. A, a single vector of int isn't going to fly apart. You don't need an allocator for that. Uh, by the way, he joined this summer because we couldn't let him go. He wasn't planning to, but anyway, that's it. So the fragmentability of a vector is low. The fragmentability of a vector of string, vector of int, the other one, vector of string is, is high. And an unordered set is medium high. Or excuse me, let me back up. Let me not get that wrong. Medium low, medium high. And the last one, this one, is would be higher because there are more moving parts and therefore they can be distributed all over. And just following just one chain might require going and getting a cache line and getting a cache line and so on and so forth. So he presented and um, it was accepted, by the way, on March 5th, 2016 into the standard and along with monotonic and multipool. So this is great stuff. Uh, these are the references. This is the outline. And the conclusions are memory allocators really worth the trouble? Yes. Um, what situations? Well, there are, quanti there, there are different cases. Uh, A, to improve uh, and preserve performance. We talked about that. And here are some of the examples. Uh, I'm just going to put them up there because I'm low on time. We want to place object in a specific kind of memory. And the, the kinds of memory is really pretty amazing. Um, and then the third one is measured test and debugging and profiling. And that's another thing that's really awesome for memory allocators. So how do we apply them effectively? Uh, if you're in this first category, which is no one really cares, just use a global allocator. But if you are, for example, uh, on a large long running system and uh, they can be ac there's, there's disproportionate access, then use local allocators. And of course, in the other cases, use local allocators maybe, but if you can't make this happen, then 
there's a problem. The find a new job is, is somewhat uh, uh, empathetic because you know people come into systems and they're just goo and you try to retrofit allocators and it doesn't always work. Uh, I'm putting up the next one. So in any case, when it's a small system and you don't care about things, just go with that. But if you have a, a subsystem that exhibits high memory utilization, then a monotonic allocator is your friend. You might want to use a monotonic allocator if it's a small system. And I'm just about done. And uh, you might want to use a local multi-pool allocator if it's not uh, that way. And finally, let's see. I'll just finish this and say, in every benchmark, pretty much local allocators are good. Uh, for long money running programs, improvements uh, uh, are, can be an order of magnitude. The overhead of using a virtual function interface in many cases is non-existent. So the final thought is object uh, level control over memory allocation uh, is intrinsic to C++ and may always uh, be, uh, must always be so if we hope to maintain the language of supremacy as the best performing high level systems language. Supporting object specific memory allocation is admittedly an added burden exasperated by an initially difficult to use model which is finally being addressed in C++17 by polymorphic memory resources. Any future incarnation of SDL should incorporate the lessons elucidated here. And finally, remember this acronym. Um, and of course, fragmentability. And uh, so, F divluck, but don't mess with the duck. Okay, and thank you very much. Ah. Uh -huh.